Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this week's lecture and planning series presentation. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Nisha Bachwe, Associate Professor of Society and Regional Planning at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, my name is Joe Hennigans. I'm a PhD student here in Columbia's Urban Planning Program, and I'll be moderating the session. And I'll start with a few brief logistical announcements and we'll then introduce our speaker. So during the talk, uh, I'd like to remind the audience members to please mute your microphones. Uh, we'll be recording today's lecture, so anyone in the audience who wishes to not be recorded should turn off their video input. Uh, the chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. And if you have technical questions that apply only to you, please message me or my co-host, uh, Maureen Abikhanam, privately. We encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. And after the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. We'll start the Q&A around 2 or 2.15 so that we have enough time for everyone's questions. And I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you have already had a chance to ask a question, please allow others to do so before asking another one. And to ask questions, there's two options. Participants can either use the raise your hand feature and uh, I'll call on you to unmute um, and ask your question directly. Or you can also type your questions in the chat box and I can read them out loud. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Nisha Bachwe is an Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning at the Georgia Institute of Technology and an adjunct professor in Emory University's School of Public Health. An expert in health and the built environment, as well as community engagement, she holds graduate degrees in both urban planning and public health. Dr. Bachwe directs the Healthy Places Lab, is a member of the Physical Activity Research Center, directs the Built Environment and Public Health Clearinghouse, and le leads data dashboards for evidence-based planning and practice. She's published numerous books, articles, reports, blogs, and videos. Dr. Bachwe is also Associate Dean for Academic Programs, collaborating with faculty in the Georgia Tech community to, de to develop world-class academic programs for Georgia Tech professional education. She serves as the voice for students enrolled in the division's programs and has oversight of all academic offerings. Dr. Bachwe has earned many uh, distinctions, including an NSF Advanced Women of Excellence Faculty Award, Hesburgh Award Teaching Fellowship from Georgia Tech, Georgia Power Professor of Excellence Award, a Rockefeller Penn Fellowship from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, and a nominated change maker by the Obama White House's Council on Women and Girls. So Professor uh, Bachwe's talk today is entitled Activating Two Decades of Built Environment and Public Health Scholarship Through an Equity and COVID-19 Lens. Uh, she will consider the reactivation uh, of connection between planning and public health that has taken place in the past couple decades and the way that this work has been unevenly applied, excluding low-income and Black, Indigenous, people of color communities from healthy urban form and equal opportunities to realize improved health outcomes. So I'm sure it will be an insightful talk on the intersection of health and planning uh, in our current crisis context. And so Professor Bachwe, if you're ready, I will pass things over to you now. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, are you, you're able to hear me, it says I'm talking. So, yes? I'm not seeing Yes, faces. sorry, we're, we're, we're thumbs Great. up. In, okay, yes. <laughs> Great, lots of thumbs up, fantastic. Well, thank you, Joseph, and the Columbia Planning Program and students for the opportunity to share just a few ideas with you on what we know about the built environment and public health, particularly from the last decade, two decades, uh, why planning in the pandemic is a new catalyst for transforming how we plan healthy places, and perhaps most importantly, who can hopefully benefit from them. I'll end with a recommendation on how youth advocacy can help us realize the creation of healthy places for all populations, not only those who can buy into them. So let's jump in. Awesome. Let's start with just a few key definitions. In Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, the first definition for environment is straightforward. It's the circumstances, objects, or conditions by which one is surrounded. But the second definition that you have on the screen is perhaps the most compelling. Um, it is that the complex of physical, chemical, and biotic factors as climate, soil, and other living things that act upon an organism or an ecological community and ultimately determine its form and survival. From a human health perspective, the environment includes all the external or non-genetic factors, physical, nutritional, social, behavioral, and others that act on humans. 
and and this um i'm sorry I'm, i've lost my place and this the built environment um, consists of those settings designed created and maintained by human efforts um, buildings neighborhoods food stores public plazas playgrounds roadways and more even seemingly natural settings such as parks um, are often part of the built environment because they have been cited, designed, and constructed by people. The built environment depends on supporting infrastructure systems for such necessities as energy, food, water, housing, and transportation. So these systems are also considered part of the built environment. As frequently cited, uh, Professor Rocha, um, sorry to interrupt, but I think we are not, uh, the slides haven't been uh, advan advancing. Uh, so you should be on defining healthy places still. So we see the title slide still. Okay. Let's see. Sorry about that. Still a title slide? Yep, still a title slide. Okay. That's all right, I'm gonna, okay. let's get us back to where we need to be. And I'm glad you told me now rather than five slides in. There's never a good time to interrupt, sorry. But... Oh, right. earlier is always better. Okay. How about now? Title slide and then slide two? Yep, we see slide two. Perfect. Awesome. Definitions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Very good. So I'm I'm gonna assume that you listen to what I said and you can capture what is on the slide um, now that we're on the right slide. Uh, so looking at health, a frequently cited definition of health comes from the 1948 Constitution of the World Health Organization, and it reads that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This broad definition goes well beyond a narrowly biomedical view to include many dimensions of comfort, happiness, and well-being. However, some, some persons who have adapted to, the, to their disabilities, such as a chronic disease or a mobility limitation, object to this definition because they consider themselves to be healthy so let's just agree to use this um, as a centering for our conversation today, understanding that it has a few limitations. You should see pictures now. Yes, Joe? Yep, we do. Awesome. So both the public health profession and design profession took modern form during the 19th century in response to rapid population growth, industrialization and urbanization, and the resulting problems of the urban environment. Modern public health took form largely during the age of industrialization with the rapid growth of cities in the 17th and 18th centuries. The urban environment, wrote one historian, fostered the spread of diseases with crowded, dark, unventilated housing, unpaved streets, mired in coarse manure and littered with refuse, inadequate or non-existing water supplies, privy vaults unemptied from one year to the next, stagnant pools of water. Ill, you, you get the point here, right? Not a pleasant environment. Another important impetuous to public health action was the workplace, a unique and often exceedingly dangerous built environment Although the air, water, and soil near industrial sites could become badly contaminate, contaminated in ways that would be familiar to modern environmental professionals, some of the most dire conditions were found within the actual factories. Now, some of this is probably quite familiar to those on the call. Um, we know that epidemics of cholera, typhoid, yellow fever, and diphtheria occurred with regularity um, in this period. Social reformers, scientists and engineers, physicians and public officials responded to these conditions in various ways with interventions focused on the built environment chief among them. So for example, the regular outbreaks of cholera and other diarrheal diseases in the 18th and 19th centuries highlight the need for water systems with clean source water 
treatment including filtration and distribution through pipes. Similarly, sewage management became a necessity, especially after the provision of piped water and the use of toilets um, created large volumes of contaminated liquid waste. Uh, this is highlighted best by the work of the physician John Snow. Um, you may know that he was a founding member of the London Epidemiological Society. Snow gained immortality in the history of public health for what was essentially an environmental epi study. During the during an 1854 outbreak of cholera in London, he observed a far higher incidence of disease among people who lived near or drank from the Broad Street pump than among people who, with other sources of water or who chose not to um, pull from that pump. That pump apparently had lots of effervescence that uh, some people traveled far to uh, be able to consume. Snow eventually persuaded local authorities to remove the pump handle and the epidemic in that part of the city soon abated. I'm happy to talk more about Jon Snow if, if there are questions there and some of the other context that surrounds the work he did. On the city planning side of water and wastewater, one response to chaotic urban growth was the recognition of the need for sanitary engineering. And that is you know, for water, sewage and waste management in cities. The concept of an urban sewage system requiring a water supply, an engineered network of pipes, um, and carefully designed street surfaces to achieve drainage required a few things. The coordinated reconstruction of urban places on a citywide scale, um, and the engineering approach, the analysis of complex systems, the forecasting of future needs, the parallel planning, of utilities, land use, transportation, and commerce was a natural precursor to multifaceted, if not comprehensive, city plans. And the 1893 Chicago World's Fair put the big plans and grand building ingenuity on display. This is where Daniel Burnham later quipped, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans, aim high in hope and work. Remember that our sons and grandsons are going to do things that would stagger us. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. Now I exaggerate in the sons and grandsons um, because you know yesterday was International Women's Day. <laughs> uh, and I just wanna pause here to highlight that he focuses on men sons and grandsons to the exclusion, to the intentional exclusion of women, daughters and granddaughters. And I highlight this one day, the day after International Women's Day. You should also know that the City Beautiful movement driven, was driven less by engineering necessity or social reform um, and was consequently derided as you know, planning without social purpose. It was a movement dedicated to a white city. And when I read this as a planning student, I thought white city because everything was painted white. Well, if you look at the picture, everything wasn't white. <laughs> the, this was a white city aesthetic that would win the order over the emerging national culture. And this national culture that was emerging at that time was one of disorder and filth. So if you go back to the, you know, your planning theory and history from the late 1800s, it was really a challenging time for the US and, and urban um, development. But in approaching the city, as a canvas on which good form could be brushed, the City Beautiful movement helped set the stage for planning to really disregard marginalized low-income and non-white communities. And we've been really working hard to get back to not just um, uh, recognizing, but supporting these communities. So let's fast forward to Jane Jacobs, uh, 70 years um, since City Beautiful. Um, what we see here is, you know, opposing such excess was Jane Jacobs, the writer and urbanist, um, whose classic Death and Life of Great American Cities, written in 1961, was really an eloquent plea, an eloquent plea for grounding city life in the observation of and respect for ordinary people's daily rhythms of living, ordinary people, not the, 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 the massive, big, 
city beautiful, but ordinary people. This tension between the grand scheme anchored in the elite fairy city and a more granular populist approach was to become a recurring motif in planning and one that echoes in public health as well. And so in, in 2001, uh, Sprawl Watch uh, was the first um, uh, publication uh, that published uh, an article that really helped to reconnect the disciplines. And in this publication, led by Dick Jackson, who some of you may know, and my good friend, Chris Katiski, who unfortunately passed away last May, um, they, they say the following, and I'm gonna read it because the words here are really important. So um, they say, when people consider factors adversely affecting their health, they generally focus on influences such as poor diet or the need for more exercise. And, and we can see this in kind of the initial, oh, you know, I'm not feeling well. Well, have you been eating? Okay, have you, know, have you been exercising? Rarely do they consider less traditional factors such as housing characteristics, land use patterns, transportation choices, or architectural or urban design decisions as potential health hazards. However, when these factors are ignored or poorly executed, the ecosystems, the ecosystems in our communities collapse. People suffer to suffer the consequences. And then let me just skip down and note that, you know, we often fail to make the connection between these all too common facets of everyday life and how, how unhealthy we are. And then in the last uh, uh, quote here, the challenge facing those who, uh, with responsibility for assuring the health and quality of life of Americans is clear. The challenge is clear. We must integrate our concepts of public health uh, issues with urban planning issues. Urban planners, engineers, and architects must begin to see that they have a critical role in public health. Similarly, Public health professionals need to appreciate that the built environment influences public health as much as any vaccine, COVID perhaps is a, a little different, <laughs> um, or water quality. And we're gonna talk a bit about um, vaccines and COVID as well, um, but this is the beginning, the beginning or the re-beginning of this reconnection between public health and planning, and I kind of think of this as like this is when um, uh, we were proselytizing that you know there's a connection. Everyone see the connection. Praise the Lord, right? This was the early part of the connection or reconnection between planning and public health. This is when Dick Jackson, Howie Frumkin, and others were really just going around and just trying to get people to pay attention to this connection. Uh, a later article, five years later, um, also from the CDC, the first one was published by CDC leaders, this one was published by the CDC, um, just notes that there are synergies. Again, this is the proselytizing that there is something happening here in this connection. Um, and this uh, synergy is in three areas, the creation of green space to promote physical activity, social integration, and better mental health prevention of infectious diseases through community infrastructure, such as drinking water and sewage systems, and protection of persons from hazardous industrial exposures and injury risks, risks through land use and zoning ordinances. And so they note that during the middle of the 20th century, the disciplines drifted apart to a certain extent because of their success in limiting health and safety risks caused by inappropriate mixing of land uses. Imagine um, how uh, intensely our fields are going to be working together much more now because of the significant risk that um, the world has faced as a result of, um, of what we see with COVID. So let me just give you a few just quick highlights. So we know with the current state, um, uh, we are living longer. And so here's some population, a population pyramid that uh, shows change over time. Uh, we are also moving to urban areas. In the early 2000s, ideas about connections of the built environment to public health were gaining traction in both the urban planning and public health. Um, subsequently, empirical analysis, pedagogy, and professional practice 
linking health and the built environment has increased exponentially since the early 2000s. Um, we see this impact on um, length of life, but we also see this transition from suburban and well, from rural to urban communities. And there are some um, nuances in where people are residing and choosing to reside now, especially as a result of COVID and happy to talk about those ideas as well. Um, also in the current state uh, of health and the built environment, we continue to experience social unrest, no notably more so from this summer, where when George Floyd was killed on May 25th, spotlighting racial injustice and the caste system. Let me repeat that, the caste system that black and brown people in particular in America and around the world exist in. This even extends apparently to royalty from the UK. And I won't go into further comment on that. Um, we see global climate change is impacting environmental um, and health, um, human health outcomes. And so climate change is a main area of um, current uh, concern and has been for some time now. We also th see health disparities accompanying these concerns uh, with the chart on the left showing the number of deaths per 100,000 population by race. And this is of whites versus blacks on the right. And again, happy to go back to some of this data. In the early 1900s, uh, this chart um, shows the top diseases that uh, they were primarily communicable or infectious. Uh, this has shifted over the last 120 years with the leading causes of death uh, uh, in the US today, primarily being non-communicable, yet persistent emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases such as flu, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19 continue to be a challenge despite the predictions of some optimists in the early days of antibiotics that infections would soon be conquered. This is a poignant reminder of the power of infections, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic that's led me to present to all of you from this sanitized Zoom box um, rather than with you in New York. We humans share the planet with microbes and will always confront infections, but chronic diseases, including heart disease, cancer, and stroke have overtaken infectious diseases as leading causes of death and suffering. Injuries, especially in relation to motor vehicle crashes are recognized as a major public health burden. Ailments such as diabetes, depression, arthritis, and asthma take a huge toll. Um, and I do wanna talk about suicide. And so if, if folks wanna ask questions about suicide and, and, the, and racial um, kind of um, prevalence, I'm happy to talk through that as well. So risk factors such as sedentary lifestyles and obesity, Product, uh, these are products of a complex web of genetic, behavioral, and environmental factors. These are all key targets of public health interventions. These developments have all contributed to the increasing public health focus on the built environment. And so this just gives you another view of some of the data on the leading causes of death um, with a really powerful um, kind of just image of where we are now, uh, or as of January 1st um, with COVID, we know that we've now passed over 500,000 deaths as a result of COVID. Uh, this is another view. This was taken March 5th of 2020. Uh, this was actually the uh, first day that I um, started my associate dean role. And, um, you know, we, we saw this and we thought, you know, this isn't really going to make its way in a significant way to impact us in the U.S. But if we look at where we are today, or as of February 23rd, how do we become bright red? I mean, we know how we became bright red. Um, and uh, we have a few things that we can do um, to turn this around. And so this is kind of a mashup of um, some uh, recommendations from a number of people, um, but hopefully it's catchy enough that uh, you'll remember and share with others. Uh, so the four W's for COVID-19 pandemic response, wash your hands, 
wear your double mask, and I have a nice double mask here. So wear your double mask, one cloth, cloth and one you know paper. Um, watch your distance and wait your turn for the vaccine. Um, but what's not on the slide is follow CDC guidelines. Follow, follow the science. I follow the science, you follow the science. But let me ask, what is common about um, these positions that you see on the slide? We see essential workers uh, who were noted as those folks who needed to continue um, you know, showing up uh, to make sure that the economy would continue. And I can't see the chat, but if you'd like to in the chat, Maybe just take a note, like what is common about these positions? We have energy workers, childcare workers, water and wastewater water, um, treatment uh, plant and other workers, agriculture and food production, critical retail. So our grocery stores, hardware stores, um, mechanics, the critical trades of construction, electricians, plumbers, transportation, nonprofit and social service organizations, I offer um, that these are workers um, who did not have the luxury to not show up. They had to go in and tend the shop. They could not work from their homes. They could not protect themselves from the exposure to COVID-19. And the populations in these positions most at risk are low income and black and brown communities. low income and black and brown communities. And we see this in the data on who is um, dying the most. And so um, let me give us perhaps just a, a broader lens to understand um, these features of the built environment that have increased uh, risk of infection and then some potential long-term implications of COVID-19 for the built environment. So we know, you know, at least based on um, uh, synthesis of, of peer reviewed literature and, and a host of other data sets that there are four key things that are significant features of the built environment that increase the uh, COVID-19 infection risk. Crowding, not density. Crowding, not density. <laughs> Poverty and racism. Poor air circulation and air pollution. But some of the potential long-term implications of COVID-19 for the built environment um, would be infection safe buildings. We can talk through what that means. Uh, working from home, re-envision streets and public spaces and green spaces. Uh, how can we reuse these spaces in a way that really allows for um, improved engagement during uh, this uh, COVID period? Change in modes of transportation. And this may not be a positive implication, um, but is an implication. And then movement from cities to exurbs. And again, we can talk through some of this. So I wanna give you now a little bit of a chart. Um, and I apologize uh, for, um, in advance for uh, perhaps a, a little bit of discomfort um, in, uh, in what I share, in the last uh, maybe 10 or so slides, 15 slides, um, because I really want us to, to embrace the privilege that we have, uh, whether you are a Columbia student, a Georgia Tech student, faculty or staff, because I see a few of you on, thank you for joining, um, uh, or the privilege that you can get online and you have the time to join the lecture. This is privilege. And with, with privilege comes responsibility. And so I'm asking you to, 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 to be a little uncomfortable, but to press through the discomfort as we move into at least this, this charge that I'm hoping to leave with you. So what you'll learn planning school and specifically in planning theory is that planning is about collective decision-making. Planning is about collective decision-making. What this means is that planning is intended to understand and include the collective, not some, but the collective in the decisions that are made and thus the outcomes that are realized. Who the collective is and how the planner includes them is dependent on many variables. 
Key among those variables is the time period. The time period you find yourself in from the early rational planning period where our motivation was to establish planning as a science. This is where um, the sons and grandsons and men were the focus. That was the who at that period. Fast forward to the 1960s and 70s where we have advocacy planning and uh, communicative planning fueled largely by the civil rights movement. And so when we think about planning, planning is about collective decision-making. Great, are we in the right slide? Great. And in this time, in the COVID-19 period, planning is especially about collective decision-making. So I want you to ask yourself and feel free to use the chat again, who has been at the table or in those Zoom meetings, perhaps, deciding on issues as it relates to COVID-19, how our cities would function, who um, is going to school and who's not going to school, um, uh, who is at the table making these decisions? What is expected of those who get to the table? What do you expect of those who are making these decisions for the collective? Who are the actual decision makers? And have we really seen collective decisions during the pandemic? So yes, we've seen collective decisions by those who hold power, but who holds the power? According to Sherry Arnstein uh, in her 1969 Ladder of Citizen Participation article, and this was in the Journal of the American Planning Association, those who hold power are those who join in determining how information is shared, goals and policies are set, tax resources are allocated, programs are operated, and benefits like contracts and patronage are parceled out. These are those who share in the benefits of the affluent society. These are the people who hold power. What I am suggesting by stating that planning in the pandemic is about power and that people with power avoid increased risk from being exposed to the virus and dying from it. Let me say that again. What I am suggesting by saying that planning in the pandemic is about power and the people with power avoid increased risk from being exposed to the virus and dying from it um uh is that you know what you see in this graph what you see in this graph is not a normal distribution we know that covid-19 is transmitted through the air every human breathes air you are breathing air right now <laughs> uh so why do we see this disparity in deaths the virus is not intentionally targeting as the chart shows black and pakistani or other ethnicities Rather, COVID-19 lives in a system that routinely puts black and brown populations at an increased risk for death from the virus because we are the most exposed. Think about that list of essential workers and those who could not work from home. This pandemic put a spotlight on not just health disparities, but also the continual injustices plaguing communities and specifically those in the lowest caste around the world. Yes, the lowest caste, as Isabel Wilkerson skillfully talks about in her, um, in her recent book. Uh, these again are um, notably black and brown people. The World Economic Forum notes five socioeconomic inequities highlighted by coronavirus, access to green space, healthcare access and outcomes, the digital divide for youth learning, the digital divide for youth learning, and for parents being able to work in a virtual environment. Think about the, think about the, the abilities that you have now working in this virtual environment that people who are not in this space all the time just don't have the luxury of honing those skills. This is part of that significant gap that's widening. And then the last thing is accessibility and disability services, just as important. These inequities are reinforced because of the system, environment, and policies 
that determine the quality and quantity of green space in communities, housing affordability, employment type and wage levels, healthcare access and insurance coverage, Wi-Fi availability in communities. Some communities don't even have Wi-Fi. And support for people with functional or physical accessibility challenges, among others. Our recent National Academies of Sciences and Engineering uh, report, a NASM report titled Communities in Action, Pathways to Health Equity states that system level changes, you keep hearing me say system, right? System level changes are needed to reduce poverty, eliminate structural racism, improve income inequality, increase educational opportunity and fix the laws and policies that perpetuate structural inequities. This can be done by addressing policies, systems, and the environment, or those items found at the base of the health impact pyramid. And at the base of the health impact pyramid, you see socioeconomic factors and changing the context. So the healthy choice is the easy choice. So the healthy choice is the affordable choice. So the healthy choice is the beautiful choice. This is where policy system and the environment change can occur often with support from advocacy efforts. Let me give you one more um, example. So another way to think about this is the iceberg example. Um, if you uh, have been in a public health or planning lecture, I'm sure this has come up before, so bear with me. So like the health impact pyramid, the bottom um, of the pyramid essentially mirrors the iceberg. That bottom of the pyramid is large. It's a solid foundation, much like the base of this iceberg. This represents systemic structure, the policy systems and environment that may manifest in our use of active transportation or single occupancy vehicles, as you see in the pictures to the right. The choices presented uh, to be physically active and to be proximal or adjacent to other people versus isolated and sedentary in your cars, these patterns of behavior are patterns. They are repeated and lead to the events that are easier to see or target. Um, health, uh, relationship and thriving or heart disease, cancer or stroke, right? These are those things that are easier to see. So, so realize, um, so as we try to realize a different outcome or the event at the top of the iceberg, you have to really work to change the behavior. You have to change, work to change the patterns of behavior. Um, but in order to change the patterns of behavior, you must change the system in which the behavior occurs. Otherwise, you're just wasting money and time. If you don't change the systemic structure, you are wasting money and time, and it's, it's just a false uh, effort. Uh, and so this idea is in line with the upstream and downstream model noted here. Uh, you can consider that these social determinants of health that are on the right side of the screen are some of our upstream and midstream factors. These include education and access, uh, education access and quality, economic stability, social and community context, neighborhood and built environment, and healthcare access and quality. Uh, these are the factors that lead to the health outcomes or those events that we have noted before. And so to plan for and with all communities in the pandemic and therefore and thereafter, we must work as practicing planners to redistribute power to those with the least power in the system. We must work to redistribute power to those with the least power in the system. Redistribute power in an equitable, not equal, but an equitable way. What I mean by this is that some communities will get more investments in economic development because they need it more than other communities. Some communities will realize increased investment in safe and affordable housing, hopefully with protections against displacement, because they need it more. 
And some communities will have their schools rebuilt and in a purposeful communities approach because they need it more than other communities. Youth and minority youth are great vessels to equip with these skills of advocating what and where the need is in communities. They know these communities. They absolutely do. We have examples where youth have been empowered to plan and advocate for change, yielding significant dividends. Let me tell you about a few. Yay, or the Youth Engagement and Action for Health program is this example. Um, it is a youth advocacy training program designed to teach advocacy for improving physical activity and nutrition assets in communities, focusing on policy systems and environmental changes. It originated in San Diego with their health department and has expanded across the country with support from the Physical Activity Research Center and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Yay, was, Yay has proven to create positive individual change in youth, adults, and decision makers, and produce positive policy systems and environmental change. Policy systems and environmental change. The Yay program focuses on three core elements, learning about advocacy and health, conducting neighborhood assessments, and completing an advocacy project, which the youth present to a decision maker in the community. I'm happy to share more on the curriculum. If you'd like to, please go to www.yeah.gatech.edu. The link is on the bottom of the slide. And there's a full set of resources if you're interested in learning more, if you wanna implement this in your community, um, if you want to share it with, you know, with, with others, please, please um, feel free to use this resource and, and see um, how it may be useful for you. I'm not going to give you the full kind of uh, quantitative outcomes um, uh, and what we saw in uh, what the students realized as a result of participating in the YAP yeah program, but I do want to give you just a very high level perspective on what the youth who participated, um, what, what they realized. So we worked with 19 clubs um, in Hawaii, California, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, DC, and Maine. These clubs included boys and girls clubs, big brothers and big sisters programs, YMCAs, I was going to break out in the YMCA dance, um, schools and after school programs. We had a total of 264 students across five racial and ethnic groups, African American, Native American, uh, Latinx, Asian American, Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian. Um, and we had about 50, 50 boys, girls. The youth advocated for a range of projects, including clean water fountains at their school, dance classes for PE instead of the one basketball in the gym, park improvements and food demos in the cafeteria to promote nutrition. We saw many positive outcomes, but most notable was that over the course of the YAY program and the advocacy work each of the clubs completed, on average, youth increased their belief that leaders in their school or community would listen to them and the belief that they have a say, they have a say in their community. And many of them saw actual change in the community. I wanna tell you a quick story uh, and you'll see a picture of, actually are these kids on my slide? Yep, so if you look at the top left, you'll see my kids from Lahui, Hawaii. Um, uh, you can tell it's Hawaii because we have the lace. So those kids were in a boys and girls club uh, near their downtown and they worked really well in partnership with the city planning office, uh, with the Get Fit Kauai organization and the boys and girls club. Um, and they said, you know what, the thing that really is concerning to us is our park. How many of you have seen uh, Moana? Is that the movie Moana, the Disney movie about the Hawaiian girl with the chicken that's always pecking around? Well, in Lahui, there are chickens everywhere. 
And those chickens have tore up <laughs> these, this park for these kids. And the kids said, look, we need our park. We have like a rock wall that has a, you know, do not trespass, you know, yellow line across it. Every step you take, you fall in a chicken hole. Um, there are concerns about our park and we don't have anywhere else nearby where we can go and relax and be physically active or just loiter, right? And one quick note, parks are for loitering. Mitchell Silver, your New York City Parks Commissioner, um, has noted that parks are for loitering. And so they didn't have a place to loiter, to sit back and relax, to play basketball or to climb the rock wall. And they said, this is what we need. So they came up with um, an evidence-based presentation to their county council and the mayor and county council members are actually in this picture. Um, and at the end of that presentation, county council awarded them $80,000 to do a park plan. And with that 80,000 in the park plan, the park renovation is moving forward today. And so, yes, these kids have the power to create change in their communities. If only we would support them and believe in them to, to do these things, to be able to see these changes. And so as a uh, practicing planner, um, as a student, you may find yourself as the only Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Pacific Islander, Asian American, Native American, or white person in the room. Yes, there will be times when you're the only white person in the room, and you should be in those spaces. But please know that you are not alone. You may go forth alone, but you stand as 10,000. This is noted by Maya Angelou in her poem, Our Grandmothers, one of my favorites. You may go forth alone, but you stand as 10,000. You are entrusted in that space with the power of 10,000. You are empowered to ask questions and work for the health and well being of marginalized communities. My Yay kids learned that they had power. They mastered it for their projects and transformed their schools and communities in many, many ways. And again, happy to share more examples. You too can plan in this pandemic with a focus on sharing power, on redistributing power, on giving voice to the voiceless, on giving a seat at the table to those who are not even able to get into the room. To do so, you must be brave. You must be the light. And so let me just close um, with this. What is your vision for a healthy, equitable, and sustainable community and world? What is your vision? What are you doing to see the light? What are you doing to be the light? How will you, you work to ensure that the communities most in need receive what they need over time to be well, to share in the benefits of the affluent society. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Don't just post it on Facebook. Don't just make a TikTok. Take the step to realize change. Take the step to share power with those without so they can realize the benefits of the affluent society and we move out of the current caste system that we find ourselves in. And so with that, I yield the mic, Joe, and happy to take um, questions and um, to have a really fantastic conversation with this audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bache. That was really inspiring and engaging talk. So yeah, we have about 25 minutes or so, maybe a little less than that for questions. Um, so just as I said at the beginning, there's, there's two options. You can either use the raise your hand feature calling you to unmute and ask your question directly, or if you're more comfortable, you can also just type in the chat box and, and I can read it out loud. So does anyone have questions? I can. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Professor Bachre, for your very inspiring and, and passionate presentation. Um, I guess my question is kind of overall, as someone who studied um, public health and planning for years, 
Were you at all surprised by the uh, U.S. response to COVID-19 and the impact on the minor the communities of minority, um, or was it something that was kind of in the pipeline, expected to happen, whether due to COVID-19 or some other um, disaster that was going to strike um, or highlight the systemic racism in the system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. Um, very good question. March 5th, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> I remember sitting in um, a leadership meeting and we were talking about COVID. What, so my associate dean hat um, uh, is uh, worn in our College of Professional Education. And we have about 16,000 um, adult learners who um, learn online, whether it be through our online master's programs or our professional education offerings. And at that time, those students, either they were online because of the online masters or they were in our building um, with a constant buzz and movement of people. How do we continue operation with COVID? What is it? How do we protect against it? We had no clue. Um, and the thought of how is this going to impact minority communities I thought it would hit us harder, but I, I didn't have the imagination to know how hard it would hit. Um, and, you know, perhaps the two most concerning areas, you know, one um, is the digital divide for parents and kids. So in uh, Southwest Atlanta, um, some of those communities, like I said, don't have access to Wi-Fi. So like, like mobile Wi-Fi trucks had to go in to give access to kids in those communities so they can go to school. Um, and the parents who are driving buses and operating the function of the society, what happens when we return and now we're in a digital first framework for everything, when we're paying for our food with our phone, like some of us do with our Apple Pay, um, just getting over that digital barrier, like we're practicing it, but there's so many people who are not and are going to be further left behind. Um, and so, yeah, I just, the, the, when we think about public health, there is, um, there's, a, there's a spot where your right to do what you want ends and my right to live begins. And we have to think beyond the individual notion of what I want to what we need to survive as a, as a public, as a community. So um, I, don't, I didn't have any idea, <laughs> Maureen. But now we know, and now that we know, we have to do better to you know, help those most in need. Thank you for your question. Well, sort of going off that, there's a question in the chat from uh, Abby Lowell, who asks, um, with the inequities laid bare under the cloud of COVID, is there a sense that we're on the cusp of a substantial transformation towards a more equitable system? I guess, is there any, do you see any prospects for hope? I do. Um, uh, I'm often the person who, you know, who says the glass is half full, even though it's just a third of the way full, right? <laughs> um, if you don't believe that something positive can happen, it's not going to happen, right? We, uh, if we can't see it and, and believe it and, and think about it, we can't make it happen. So even if it's gray outside, we have to push through the darkness. And that's, that change, Abby, is not something that that only I do, but it's something that we all do, right? We have to work where we find ourselves. Uh, we have to work in the spaces um, that we're gifted to be in. Um, I can't do the work of a senator. I can't do the work of, um, of a public health practitioner because that's not where I work. I work at Georgia Tech. I serve the institution. I'm working to make sure that our faculty and students can come back safely in the summer and in the fall. Um, you know, and, and I'm doing that on a team of people who are committed to the collective benefit of our students. That's where I'm working. I work at Georgia Tech in the city planning program and teach students to think about issues of equity and disparities. So when they go into all of their other classes, they ask who's missing? What voices are we not hearing? Um, who are we not reading? 
Um, and and what's, what's left out of this conversation? And so that's where I work. And I have to believe, Abby, I have to believe that I am investing my energy, as Maureen noted, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm an extrovert, if you can't tell. Um, but I'm investing my energy into the future for my children, for your, for your daughter, Abby. I'm investing in her so she has a better world to live in. Because if I don't do it, if you don't do it, if Joseph doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. Thank you. That was inspiring, Professor. Thanks. Carolyn, do you have a question? Yes. Um, so first, thanks so much for um, this, as others have said, very inspiring talk. Um, my background actually was in public health before I came to planning. So it's been um, really uh, exciting for me to see this material on a screen again. Um, so I'm curious, as we think about the new knowledge that these fields have been developing on factors in our environment that are associated with our health, and think about the fact that uh, marginalized communities disproportionately have been disinvested in so that they're not able to develop, um, you know, these green spaces or um, equitable access to um, other built environment factors. Um, how do we think about reinvesting in those communities in a way where residents will actually be able to benefit from those investments? Because oftentimes, of course, what we're seeing in the US and in, in uh, cities is gentrification that where um, parks or bike lanes or other things that ostensibly would be linked to health, um, where those are getting put in, it actually is triggering uh, rising um, speculation and housing costs and adversely affecting the community. Um, so curious for any um, insight that you have on how to navigate that tension and ensure that communities um, are able to benefit. Carolyn, you, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, and perhaps that's the most important question um, for us to answer. And I think, you know, the answer is simple and yet, yet it's the most complex because the solution is that we take a policy systems and environmental approach. This means that we have to make sure that there are uh, policies in place to protect affordability of units. Um, and it's not just that we have um, LIHTC funding available, but that those small and medium sized affordable um, housing uh, developments that are typically owned by you know, a mom and dad or you know, a small you know, LLC, um, that they have the tools they need to maintain affordability, that they are not um, enticed so much by the private market to sell. And then those, um, those last ba um, bastions of, of affordability are lost to the city, that um, the, there are policies in place for um, uh, um, uh, perhaps a tax allocation district. So the, um, the, there's a land trust that can, that can decrease the overall cost, right? That's, in, that's increasing in the housing. So the resident isn't really being um, taxed from $600 a year to $3,500 a year, right? As we see developments like the High Line, the Belt Line, and a whole host of lines that come through as the waterfronts for these communities and they displace people. We have to think about what are those policies that we have to put in place that are protective for communities to stay and not be displaced. We want the beautification that comes from gentrification, but not the displacement, right? So what are the policies that we need to make sure people can stay? And we have to ask that question before we you know, put the shovel in the ground. That has to be in place beforehand. It has to be in place beforehand. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see displacement. So it, it's we have to think about what are those policies that will allow for the people who need to be in these spaces once they're transformed, um, who've been here for the last 50 years, to allow them to stay and enjoy the, the beautiful environment so they can now walk to the grocery store um, rather than you know living in the next county over because they couldn't afford the house anymore. Thank you. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions? I, I have one, but if anyone else wants to hop on, I'll defer. Okay, maybe while people are, are thinking, um, I, I've, I couldn't help but like think when, I, when you showed the slide about the implications for the built environment of uh, COVID, like it was sort of an obvious connection to the slides you've shown earlier about, about the negative health impacts of sprawl and of all these other things. A lot of those, of those impacts that you projected for the built environment after COVID like yeah. are the same things that had, that we know cause negative um, health impacts. So I guess I'm just sort of wondering about what, <laughs> uh, like what is sort of the, the scholarship right, right now or what are policymakers thinking about sort of how to mitigate that or is there like a risk that COVID is actually gonna decrease health outcomes and all these other measures too because of the built environment um, implications. So I, so I think you're um, thinking about the implications um, of COVID-19 on the built environment, uh, where I talked about infection safe buildings, working from home, change in modes, or perhaps it's around crowding, not density, the features of the built environment that increase the risk. Yeah, I guess of the of those, like the idea of more automobile use, more yeah. potentially moving to the exurbs, you know, yep. more uh, working from home where you don't leave the house, like those would all seem to be. Yes. Yeah. And so, Joe, just to make sure I, I, I answer your question, is the question, what what's on the horizon as it relates to policy systems and environment uh, for these five uh, implications of COVID-19? Yeah, I guess just I'm curious whether people have thought about how to sort of mitigate the negative health impacts that some of these things like like moving mm -hmm. to the sprawling areas or move, shifting to cars might have right. on sort of long term health. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, uh, where, where, where do I start? So um, there are lots of innovations that have resulted from this pressure pot that we have been in because of COVID. We see innovations in how um, HVAC systems are monitored and treated. We see um, innovations in how classrooms are cleaned with the different fogging machines. We see innovations in how um, streets are being utilized with streets being opened to people and closed to cars, not just you know in ciclovias um, in um, Mexico and Colombia, but all over the world. And it's not an event; it's just you know open the street to people. So I see a host of innovations that we realized in the built environment um, because of COVID um, that will continue and eventually make its way into uh, <laughs> new practice and policy. Um, I. Uh, um, I have a daughter who's in Boston and on a um, uh, on a ride, a lift ride from the airport uh, one day, the lift driver said, you know, it's horrible that, you know, these Boston planners are making these streets narrower and taking away lanes and, um, you know, forcing people to walk. Um, and uh, but then later on in the conversation, he said, but, you know, man, it's so cool to be able to go to the uh, next to the um, the river uh, near near Harvard and walk on a Sunday and ride a bike and that's where my kid learned to ride a bike and so so I I think we're going to see more of these innovations that we are practicing now during COVID um, uh, kind of really focused in future policy and planning practice and best practices that that will continue um, and as it relates to transportation. You know, public transit has had it really bad um, before COVID, and it's and it's challenging if you have a partial public transit system. Um, if you're in uh, New York City or other place where you have a fantastic transit system, I think that's where the behavior change has to occur, where you have the universal mask wearing, where you have um, uh, uh, con uh, considerations around density and frequency of trains. And so I don't think these things will go away. I think we're just going to treat them differently to make sure that we can protect the public health. I think about um, uh, China, um, Beijing, for example, they're using their trains and everyone's wearing a mask um, and they don't have the mortality numbers we do. And so we can, we can return to business, but we have to return to business as a country. It can't be that I return to business and act as an individual. 
Um, and so I don't see public transit breaking down unless we don't innovate. I don't see um, uh, cities dying unless we don't innovate. Um, think about, <laughs> Joe, all of the people who are working from home and these offices are empty. You're gonna have a lot more people living downtown. That is prime real estate, right? And so there's gonna be a significant innovation in what the landscape are, of our cities um, look like as a result of COVID, but are we gonna be brave enough to make the right choice and innovate in a way um, that allows for, again, the most marginalized um, to realize the gains equitably that they need. Could I ask a question? So um, one of my YAH teachers is on, uh, Dr. Brian. Um, I'm so happy to see her on with us today. Um, I wonder perhaps if Dr. Brian, and I didn't prep her for this, <laughs> But I wonder if she would be willing to um, share one or two things about um, her kids uh, in the Yeah Club, maybe what they uh, did for their project and any anything that's resulted um, from that. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Boshway, for having me. Um, I think, yeah, we never thought about it at the time, has definitely prepared us for COVID. Um, in that the students learned skills that they needed to be able to advocate for the environment, um, for their health, things that are so necessary and important during these times that they are able to advocate and say, you know, this is what I need. Um, I need healthy food. Um, in a time where, you know, parents are losing jobs and there is food insecurity, students are able to say, you know what, I know the benefits of a healthy meal. Um, through yeah, they were able to, to figure these things out and they're able to say, you know what, I know I need to seek out a healthy meal through the food bank for myself, for family, for other students. Um, and just being able to, now they recognize that the parks are closed um, and, and how else can we get that physical activity that is so important that we realize during our assessments that were so important. Um, they are spending more time in the neighborhood. They are more aware of aspects of the neighborhood and the community that need to be improved so that we can be healthier. Um, and so it was almost, it was it just, it's foresight that they were able to gather these skills while we were doing, yeah, and they're now being able to put those, those things into practice now. And even if not in actual action, but in thought, so they know how to move forward with the skills that they learned during that program. So I, I think, yeah, it was fantastic and it's working well for them during COVID, albeit, you know, this, the, the seriousness of COVID. Dr. Boshwe. Thank you so much, Dr. Brian. I really appreciate uh, you feeling, being willing to respond to a question and, and for your reflection. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, if there's, unless anyone wants to pop in with one last question, I think we can draw this to a close. Um, I want to thank you again very much, Dr. Bache, for taking the time for, to speak with us uh, on behalf of Columbia GSTEP and the Urban Planning Department in particular. We really appreciate that you were able to join us, um, even in this sanitized box, as you said. Uh, and so thanks everyone for attending and, and please uh, make sure to join us next week as well for our LIPS talk at the same time with Michael Sneedle on Opportunity Zones uh, in Baltimore. Uh, so thank you to everyone. And thank you, especially Dr. Bachelet. Thank you so much, Joe. Have a great day, everyone. Wash your hands, wait your turn, watch your distance, and do the other W that I'm not remembering right now. Bye-bye. <laughs>